Welcome, fellow MRI buffs. We are a growing concern well into our second decade. This is the, I guess in some ways, it's the, the second of what I hope will prove to be a semi-regular series of, uh, of meetings on MRI turbulence, both astrophysical and formal aspects. That was the first. Hmm? Ah, non, pas cette fois. So, uh, as most of you appreciate, our conceptualization of astrophysical magnetic fields uh, has undergone uh, a sea change. Weak magnetic fields used to be wimpy, passive things, uh, as kind of illustrated stylistically from the cover of Keith Moffat's book, Magnetic Fields and Electrically Conducting Fluids, where we see the field lines passively being wrapped up by, a, I guess what you call a differentially rotating disk. So that is by way of contrast of what really happens when you put a weak magnetic field in a disk. These are movies that John Hawley made, it seems like ancient history now, back uh, around the turn of the century. Uh, and you see that we understand now that the effects of even weak magnetic fields uh, are dynamically of tremendous importance in uh, even just a disk which appears to be simply differentially rotating. The presence of a magnetic field leads to a breakdown of laminar rotation uh, into turbulence, something which may, I would say, is pr not possible otherwise, although there are issues there that remain to be settled, I suppose. Um, more generally, what the magnetic field does is tell the fluid about the free energy gradient. So free energy gradients temperature gradient, the angular velocity gradient, as opposed to entropy and angular momentum uh, gradients, become sources of instability, not just diffusive fluxes. And in fact, uh, it is, I think, probably less widely appreciated. The MRI is really one of a more general class of this type of magnetic instability, including some very uh, interesting and to me very uh, surprising uh, work that Elliot Quatert has just done recently on the role of uh, thermal fluxes in the presence of weak magnetic fields. So the basic mechanism of the MRI is by now very familiar. I don't think we have to run through this cartoon again. But many issues still simmer. There were uh, things we thought that we knew back in the 1990s that we're not so sure we know now. There were things that we knew we didn't know and still don't know. And there were things that we didn't know that we knew. I'm getting confused. <laughs> but which we may, there were issues that we didn't even realize were issues at the time. So numerical simulations from the early days of, uh, of the MRI verified that enhanced turbulent angular momentum transport resulted from the nonlinear resolution of the instability. So this was seen in both local shearing box runs and later when global codes became available in global runs as well. Turbulence was sustained, uh, angular momentum, significantly enhanced angular momentum transport was present and remained despite the various dissipative processes which were inherent in the code, and sometimes explicitly. But it is still the case that the simulation of a turbulent fluid is an art, and it is fraught with misleading traps, as I say, for the unwary. We still don't know exactly what turns off the MRI. We would like to understand better how MRI fits into the general picture of field amplification and classical dynamo theory. We know now as well that the Kolmogorov picture of hydrodynamical turbulence with large scales being 
insensitive to small scale dissipation is not true for MHD turbulence. This picture, oh, I have some pointers here. This picture on the left is what we would used to call a device. Uh, on the right, we have a drop of water upside down. So the effective Reynolds number for the device is 10 to the 11th. For the drop of water, it's 10 to the 4th. Nevertheless, you can see that in its gross features, and somewhat remarkably detailed in the gross features, the two are very, very similar. What the Reynolds number of 10 to the 4 lacks is the fine, uh, detailed, very small stru structure that you see uh, in the atomic bomb on the left. But otherwise, if you had a code that where you could resolve that had an effective Reynolds number of 10 to the 4, 10 to the 5, uh, you could see if you were interested in this problem in hydrodynamical turbulence, you could do a, f a very good job in terms of eliciting gross features uh, of the flow without resolving the very small scales, and in fact, uh, you wouldn't have missed anything of tremendous importance. This unfortunately doesn't appear to hold for MHD turbulence, at least not the types that we're interested in studying here, where Prandtl number effects are important. So simmering numerical issues that are still uh, unresolved. Have we run any turbulent MRI study to the point where we can say it is converged? Would anyone claim that? I think that's a, we're, we're still not quite there. Does it matter that it's not converged? Two, as I just hinted at before, the old days of don't worry about the small scales, grid will take care of everything, those days seem to be gone. The magnetic Prandtl number, the ratio of the viscosity to resistivity, has an unmistakable effect on MHD turbulence with the sense of it being around Prandtl numbers of unity, which are the only ones we can really treat reliably. It is clear that the level of MHD turbulence increases as the Prandtl number passes from below unity to greater than unity. And several people here uh, will talk about this, I think, later uh, in the program. I'm anxious to hear Alex, Sebastian Cremange, Geoffroy Le Sœur, and Pierre Yves. Uh, there is also an interesting possibility that I, uh, my student and I looked at just, uh, just briefly, and that is wh whereas normally the bulk of the body of astrophysical disks is squarely in the small Prandtl number regime, uh, there are disks where in fact you have uh, a domain which has a Prandtl number much bigger than unity juxtaposed against the outer portions of the disk, usually the inner portions of the disk, and the outer portions of the disk have a Prandtl number much less than unity. And the question is, what happens when the flow changes its character as it passes through this Prandtl number transition? What happens to the sensitivity to Prandtl number when it gets much bigger than one or much less than one? Intuitively, one might think that it would be much less sensitive. If the Prandtl number is 10 to the 6, it shouldn't matter whether it's 10 to the 12th and vice versa. Um, if we can't now set nu equals eta equals 0, just forget about the dissipation coefficients in the code. Can we ever get away with setting just one of them equal to zero if we want to look at either very high or very low Prandtl number flows? That's something that has yet to be resolved. Uh, an old classic problem. One of the things we hope to extract from numerical simulations are things like the alpha coefficient, which depend upon correlated fluctuations. Should we ever trust? correlated fluctuations that we derive from numerical simulations. How can we improve that? How much averaging do we have to do? Uh, it would be a shame if we never could extract that kind of information because we 
turns out the codes just have to be run forever or you have to be, there's not a good way to separate mean values and fluctuation values. It's a very important problem uh, which requires uh, more work. Does anyone know how to do a global simulation with a finite BZ magnetic field? That's a classic problem and an important problem which everybody avoids because codes tend to crash. They, you find the disk slides in and it slides out and before something resembling sustained turbulence happens, the show is over. Uh, presumably there must be disks or maybe not. There must be disks in nature with ha which have non-vanishing mean Z values and it would be nice to know how they work. What aspects of a numerical simulation should we allow to be compared with observations? And where should we advise caution? Too much and we will be seen to overclaim. On the other hand, too little and this is about the only thing that the numerical simulations will be good for, which would be <laughs> unfortunate. <laughs> That's kind of nice. Huh? <laughs> uh, contemporary. Everybody still uses Shikunya, Shikunya, not everybody, but I would say people who work uh, with observations and really need to have some kind of a phenomenological handle on turbulence they still use Shakura Sinai of alpha theory. To what extent uh, do direct numerical simulation support this and to what extent do they undermine this? This would be an important area, I think, to clarify. What about radiative transport in MHD turbulence? Where do things stand, actually? Uh, Julian just showed me a preprint minutes ago, which looks like there's been some interesting progress on that question. So I will Given our very real computational limitations, how can we ever hope to put the MRI on an observational footing? And what kind of problems might be, are there, we're very focused, I guess, on the observational, how shall I say, on the, on the radiative properties of the disk. What kind of effects does the turbulence have on the photons that are emitted? Are there other problems, other things we can extract from the simulations which may uh, be more robust? And in fact, the MRI is not without some distinct astrophysical consequences and some interesting possible future directions. Direct confrontation with observations, as always, requires some care. Uh, I was uh, struck recently by a paper uh, by uh, this long list of authors here. It looks like uh, the, a lot of people from the, the Cambridge group on what they call the magnetic nature of disk accretion onto black holes, where essentially they tried to deduce something about the disk by looking at its exhaust. They examined the wind that was being emitted from the disks and using some uh, powerful line diagnostics and it has to be said some rather indirect uh, approaches uh, were able to deduce or they were, they claimed they were able to deduce the fact that the wind had to be produced by essentially magnetic processes rather than radiative or direct thermal processes. Um, so this kind of an approach is in its infancy and in fact may be quite interesting to look not directly at the disk but at what comes off the disk and be able to deduce what the nature of the thing producing it is. Um, this is a, a, a fascinating result from timing data. This is a plot of the relative probability density versus the normalized flux of SIG X1. Uh, 
And the point is that the luminosity, of course, varies from one observation to the next. There's fluctuations. And when you plot the distribution of those fluctuations, it turns out to be an incredibly good log normal fit. Does the MRI have anything to say about that? Well, in fact, when uh, this is a paper that Chris Reynolds did addressing this problem, and they couldn't, of course, use the disk luminosity directly, so they used a proxy. I think they used the stress tensor and did a similar kind of fit and found that the statistics of the stress tensor were much better fit to a log normal distribution than they were to any kind of simple Gaussian. So why might the MRI be log normal? Well, here's a something, here's putting, I'm trying to put the ball in play. Numerically, when you look at the MRI, what one is, you're struck by is that you look at local regions and you see constant what appears to be exponential growth up to some period of time, the field lines stretch and then they mix and then the process repeats. Now if the lifetime of the linear growth itself is a simple random Gaussian, uh, then the local amplitudes that are reached are in fact grow like an exponential of this random Gaussian variable. If these are then thermalized and radiated, then it is the amplitudes that are responsible for the observed luminosity. And if T is a Gaussian random variable, is distributed as a Gaussian random variable, then the exponential of A times T is distributed as a log normal random variable. So maybe there's a connection along those lines. But I point this out as an area which is completely unexplored and uh, is a possible way to draw or to place the, the numerical simulations that we're so interested in on a firmer observational plane. Protostellar disks, I hope we hear a lot about those at this conference, one of my favorite topics. One of the most important MRI challenges, perhaps the most difficult, non-ideal MHD is involved, dust, molecules, non-thermal ionization. Mark Wardle will tell you everything you want to know, I suspect, and more about protostellar disks. Um, we would like to understand their global structure, and in particularly for the case of protostellar disks, we want to understand how passive scalars are diffused in MHD turbulence. That's another area which has been underexplored and is potentially very, very fascinating because there's meteoritic data on the solar system which is uh, not well understood but potentially an incredibly rich source of information about what the primordial magnetic field may have been. Protostellar disks are clearly, obviously, no question, in the Hall regime. This has never been simulated, except, uh, remember Jim, <laughs> by Jim and Takayasho Sano in one study back in the old days. We need to do more. The conclusion there was that it didn't seem to be, uh, it was clearly, there was a difference between Hall runs and non-Hall runs, but it didn't seem to make uh, an order of magnitude difference in terms of the onset of turbulence and so on. But I think that's a problem that needs to be explored more carefully. And particularly, that is a problem where high resolution really may be very important. I just remind you, this is a, uh, a parameter space plot that I did a while back uh, with my student, Matt Kunz, just to orient you. The, um, this, the axis here is the density. This is temperature. So this is kind of for the regime of protostellar disks. A is ambipolar diffusion. H is, stands for the Hall electromotive forces, and O is ohmic resistivity. And in fact, you can see the, the region where ohmic resistivity dominates here is really pretty much in the high density portions of the disk. If you look and see where models of 
protostellar disks lie. They kind of lie in this big green blob here where Hall effects are very important. Uh, there are questions about the nature of transport in protostellar disks. I think, in my opinion, a swift karate chop to the back of the neck was delivered to hydrodynamic turbulence models by this beautiful experiment that was done here at Princeton, which showed that at Reynolds numbers of 2 million, uh, the Keplerian profiles were as stable as uniformly rotating profiles. But people still complain about various things, so I suppose that remains an open issue. But I would say at this point, certainly the onus is on people who wish to you invoke hydrodynamical turbulence in Keplerian disk, they will have to put up at some point. Let me move on. Um, there are some new directions uh, in terms of trying to understand MRI turbulence. They're new directions, but they're sort of old techniques. Uh, I have been playing with these with uh, my students and some of my co-workers. And the one of them is essentially called a reduced model technique, which, depending upon uh, how you set up the problem, you could either try to derive directly from the fluid equations, or you can pull them out of the air and see how well they work and whether they predict anything interesting. The idea is to try to capture some simplified version of the turbulence by a set of coupled nonlinear differential equations, ordinary differential equations. Typically, you might be playing with temperatures, Fourier components of the velocity, things like this. Of course, the classical Lorentz system was derived uh, directly along these lines. And uh, I got interested in this approach by trying to understand how thermal instability works in disks. I was always dissatisfied with the, the classical approach to that topic, which was to simply assume that you had viscous heating and then looked at the thermal stability properties of a viscous fluid. Uh, it seemed to me the fluctuations were very important there. So here's a very simple system. If Y represents a uh, generic fluctuation of either the magnetic field or the velocity, then I imagine I have a linear growth, which this is this gamma times y term, which could be temperature, gamma, the growth rate, could be temperature dependent if resistivity is involved. So this represents essentially the MRI. And then some kind of a nonlinear damping term. The A of t might represent, for example, uh, something like Prandtl number effects, where the nonlinear saturation appears to be a function of the Prandtl number, therefore the temperature. That is accompanied by a uh, temperature equation where I have heating quadratic in Y and then some kind of a cooling function. So if I use this as a stand-in for a more complicated disk, and I said, well, this has a lot of features which are similar to, similar to disks. What are its stability properties? I recover something that looks actually something rather like a classical field criterion. Uh, and then I have a uh, second criterion for stability. Ct is a partial derivative with respect to temperature for the A coefficient and the C coefficient. And what one finds is if I plot here in the green, this is my cooling curve. I, haven't, I should label my axes. I apologize. Temperature increasing this way. Then in the case where I have a temperature dependence in A, which is rather flat at low temperatures or at high temperatures because the Prandtl number effect is saturated, but changes rapidly as I go through a Prandtl number transition, then it turns out that this stability criterion predicts that those two points, those two stable points were nonlinear where I have uh, essentially the, those three points represent the fixed points of that set of equations. 
there are three fixed points, two of which are stable and one of which is unstable. And this looks for all the world like an FGH model of the interstellar medium. And we see the same sort of topology repeating here. The interesting thing about this is that it's not simply a matter of playing with it. This is something which in principle can be computed directly and tested with Shearing Box models. A more complicated diagram of the phase space that Pierre Lesaf and I worked out. And I'm running out of time, but there is actually uh, a, a very a fascinating study that Pierre Lesaf completed just before this meeting on parasitic instabilities, work that was pioneered by Jeremy Goodman. Uh, in the case where you have a vertical magnetic field, you set up what is known as initially a channel float, what looks like streaming solutions, which on upon which there are secondary instabilities, so-called parasitic modes. And in fact, uh, Pierre has shown that we can understand uh, in surprising quantitative detail how the parasitic modes, the fundamental mode, and the temperature of the disk uh, exist. I don't have time to go through that now, but on the left is a, I think the black here is the temperature and corresponds to the red on this graph. The uh, dashed lines correspond to the fundamental modes. What you see when you do the simulations, it's like shot noise. It builds up, it collapses. It builds up, collapses. It builds up and collapses. And the relative phases of the buildup of the fundamental mode and then the secondary parasitic modes can actually be described, I was stunned uh, extremely well by this reduced model approach. So I'm sorry I'm a little vague on that, but I wanted to get that in. A novel application of the MRI, what we call the magnetostrophic MRI. I want to touch on this and give myself a little bit of advertising. We have recently investigated the effects of the MRI at the center of the Earth. Of course, you know, the, the covers on these things are always much better than what's inside, as always. So this is a, <laughs> a very simple uh, model of uh, the liquid core of the Earth. Um, uh, when you have two uh, spheres, which are Rel rotating relative to one another. The flow is, slightly, is more complicated than Kuwait flow. You get what is known as a Stewardson layer, kind of at the tangent surface here, where you have most of the shear concentrated. And a local WKB analysis reveals that there should be uh, an MRI instability. This is remarkable because this is a fluid which is highly resistive. This is essentially an iron, liquid iron core. And uh, there's hardly any shear. The Earth rotates more or less in solid body rotations. Nevertheless, for the kinds of parameters that we believe to be representative of the flow there, uh, assuming kind of the most favorable circumstances for the presence of the MRI, we found indeed such modes would fit into this cavity. And from the geophysical point of view, uh, have interesting growth rates and length scales, growth rates of order a thousand years or so, uh, length scales of order thousands of kilometers. In this case, because the growth rates are relatively long compared to the rotation periods, in fact, the uh, governing equations in their entirety for the, for the perturbations are a balance between Coriolis forces and magnetic tension forces Little v and little b are perturbations here. And the only place where we have a time dependence in this problem is in the induction equation itself. So I'm running out of time. Let me at least give you a picture of, skip over the details, of what this looks like. So this is a version of the MRI. I have my standard z, phi, and r coordinates. And this is supposed to be a radial field line, excuse me, a vertical field line with a radial distortion coming out of the screen. So I make a radial displacement distorting the streamline. 
The shear pushes it in the minus phi direction. So now I have a azimuthal tension pointing back in the plus phi direction due to the presence of the component of the distorted field line along phi. That has to be immediately counterbalanced by a Coriolis force in the opposite direction. But that Coriolis force can only be produced by a further radial displacement which reinforces the original. And this is the basic process which is driving the magnetic field line out. So a quick summary. Numerical issues, perhaps I'll just, I won't go through the whole, I'll leave that up. But uh, I've sort of divided the domain into numerics, the observational plane, radiative forces, correlations, the temporal domain that I've discussed, outflow diagnostics, many effects in the non-ideal MHD, dead zones I hardly mention, but very important to understand or perhaps I should say so-called dead zones because they may very well be presence. There may be the stresses there that uh, uh, are, have been overlooked. Um, uh, oh, planets in MRI. There's another topic, another future direction. Uh, I'll have to leave that to someone else. And then un and underexplored directions, reduced models, non-traditional applications, and Scalar diffusion problems are all, I think, uh, poised to become front and center. And I'll stop there. Thanks. Thanks.